Good afternoon. I'm Anuj Mehrotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and I am delighted to welcome you to this session in the George Talks Business Series. Now, before I introduce today's guest, let me introduce our moderator. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vanessa Perry, the Dean for Faculty and Research and Professor of Marketing, Strategic Management and Public Policy at the G George Washington University School of Business. Her research is focused on consumers in financial and housing markets, public policy, and marketplace discrimination, and has been widely published in both scholarly and industry-oriented outlets. Dr. Perry has served as Senior Advisor to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, as an expert appointee at the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and as a consultant to numerous public and private senior sector clients. Before joining the faculty at GW, Dr. Perry was a senior economist at Freddie Mac. She is a recipient of numerous awards, including the 2020 Amer uh, American Marketing Association Multicultural Mentoring Award of Excellence and a AMA EPSCO Annual Award for Responsible Research in Marketing. Thank you, Dr. Perry, for moderating the session today. Thank you. And I, now I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished guest, Mr. Eric Hilton, the Commissioner of the Small Business Self-Employed Division at the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Hilton was appointed to the position in September 2019, and prior to that served as the Deputy Chief of IRS Criminal Investigation. He began his criminal investigation career as a special agent and held increasingly responsible positions, including Assistant Director in the Office of Narcotics and Counterterrorism, Assistant Special Agent in charge of the Washington Field Office and Special Agent in charge of the Philadelphia Field Office. Mr. Hilton is also the former chair for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Task Force for Tax Crimes and Other Financial Crimes, and was based in Paris, France. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Mr. Eric Hilton. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Hilton. No, and thank you. Take it away, Vanessa. Well, I just can't bring myself to call you Mr. Hilton. Uh, it's been, um, <laughs> it seems like just yesterday we were both roaming the halls of Benjamin Banneker Academic High School here in Washington, D.C. True. Top True. 100 <laughs> school in the country. Um, and I want to take a moment to give a special shout out to the Banneker family, uh, and in particular, the class of 85 achievers of uh, which yes. we were both uh, members of that group. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's good to see you. Welcome to the George Washington University School of Business. Um, Thank you. Tell us a bit about your career trajectory at the IRS. How did it start? So uh, first, thank you, Vanessa. Um, truly appreciate uh, George Washington um, giving me the opportunity to, to just kind of speak a little bit about the IRS. And, uh, and I appreciate the, the comments about our alma mater, uh, Benjamin Banneker, our high school and that connection. So thank you so much. But it, it's, I have had a fabulous career. Uh, I've been with the organization now 30 years. Can you believe it? Um, and it's been great you know, all with the Internal Revenue Service, even though I've had 12 different positions uh, within the Internal Revenue Service, uh, they've all been there and started off really in a service component uh, and just starting um, answering phone calls for, for uh, American taxpayers. And so that kind of laid the foundation for me, uh, kind of moving forward and then moved on to our exempt organizations um, office and uh, more of a tax auditor in that regard. And then some, one day someone says, hey, you're an accounting major. Um, you should think about forensics accounting. And I had to go home and look that up a little bit. And <laughs> so therefore I went and, you know, thinking about, okay, what is that? And so IRS has this little known organization called criminal investigation. So, so, um, so I, I applied and became a special agent uh, almost 27 years ago and retired as a special this year. And it's been fabulous. And the commissioner appointed me to, uh, to be the commissioner of small business self-employed. And it's been incredible over the time. And as expressed in the intro, had a number of uh, fabulous positions there. And more one that I, I truly enjoy is being a director of our international operations 
in which I interacted uh, with over, <clears throat> I would probably say 30, 40 different countries and visited those countries and exchanged uh, issues as it relates to emerging topics for criminal tax evasion, uh, international corruption, uh, terrorist financing. So uh, just, so it's been a fabulous career. So I, I will add just while we're there though, we are hiring. So I will throw that out there as well as IRS is, is, that, is hiring right now. So um, so if you talk about the beginning of my career, hopefully some folks out there will think about the beginning of, beginning of their career with the IRS. Well, thank you for that because we have a number of students in our <laughs> audience. Uh, so um, um, many with interest in those areas. So so thanks for yeah. for that point. So going back to your time in the criminal investigation division, uh, as you know, I'm fascinated by crime. Um, was that <laughs> as exciting? <laughs> was that as exciting as it sounds? Very much so. I mean, you can't even imagine the things that you're involved in, expertise that you need, as I expressed, being that forensics accounting and being an expert as to the following the money. Uh, I was an accountanger and, and having that, learning the, the, the skill sets that you need to follow the money. I think one of the things when we talk about IRS criminal investigations, there, there is a significant financial case that is in the news. IRS criminal investigation is there. You know, within IRS as a whole and many of the compliance functions, you learn those skill sets to be a, a fine uh, investigator in that regard. And so within criminal investigation, I, I, I learned that and, and fine tuned that expertise as it relates to political corruption, as it relates to international corruption, as it relates to narcotics related money laundering, as it relates to just tax, flex tax. I would always say that it, it what was really interesting just the diversity of work that I, I, I was involved in. One day I could be working a uh, unscrupulous uh, return preparer who has pried, uh, preyed on a uh, low income housing development area in which he's filed false returns on behalf, he or she, I would say, uh, on, on behalf of individuals. So you have to be able to uh, interview those witnesses. And then the next day, you may be interviewing a uh, high level official within a company, either CEO, I've interviewed CEOs at times on a major international uh, tax issue. So you have to be able to have that, that, that depth and breadth of, of experience to be able to work in both uh, communities and both areas. So um, also, as you as you mentioned, being there, uh, as I matriculated through, uh, I was in charge of our narcotics and counterterrorism office, which was uh, an exciting opportunity uh, there as well. And, and, and working throughout the world as you know, major cartel figures who are trying to launder their funds uh, throughout the world using various means, um, worked on international corruption issues. Um, so there's quite a bit there. So uh, it's been an exciting 30 years, um, done a number of press conferences uh, associated with many of these investigations. So it, it, it's been, and I will say to anyone that's interested in it, you know, should pursue it. You know, it's a, definitely uh, a thought of using your accounting skills and just kind of having those investigative skills as well. Wow, wow, fascinating, um, thank you. Um, so there's clearly over this time span, there've been a lot of changes in technology. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how uh, the IRS keeps up with incidences of cybercrime and corruption and terrorism and some of the kinds of um, issues that you just talked about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I th that's a very fascinating question. I mean, I think it, it, it has been a journey, you know, to try to keep up with the technological advancements um, years ago. Uh, you know, I, I look at it from the standpoint and I'll make sure I, I add this in there. With an IRS criminal investigation, we are um, sworn law enforcement officers, just like any other federal 
agency. And so able to do a number of different activities that are associated with that. And one, um, and just kind of speaking to your question as far as the technological changes, is the fact that, you know, in conducting a search warrant, um, so years when I first started, we would actually go out and do a search warrant and we would have a truck full of uh, books and records. And so I remember one of my first cases and I had, I can call it a, a war room full of information and I'm trying to find the needle in the haystack information that is there. Um, whereas the changes now is that, that all of that information is on a, is on the computer. Is on in the cloud, and so therefore now, and you happen to sift through that information, you know, um, via your computer versus uh, looking at the documents. But as time has changed, and you look at a number of mechanisms in which individuals try to hide their money, I'll share uh, a couple of quick good stories uh, in, in that regards. And as, as I was in charge national, even before when I was in our Washington field office or Washington DC field office, we were investigating international uh, tax evasion. And one of the bigger cases is the UBS case in which the UBS uh, was one of the major Swiss banks that was helping US citizens evade their taxes. Uh, and so they had relationship managers, uh, investor managers that would come over and, and help them uh, either put their money give their funds to them or other mechanisms in which they will hide the funds. We prosecuted UBS and they, they signed a deferred prosecution agreement and in which they had to pay $780 million, wow. you know, by assisting tax uh, individuals. And so it gets better. It gets better. So then after that, uh, while I was in the Philadelphia office working with our New York office, we, uh, Weglin Bank, which is the oldest Swiss bank, uh, actually working with them, and they had to pay $1.5 billion, you know, associated with hiding funds. And so, and then it even gets better than that. Then we also prosecuted and moved forward with Credit Suisse, which is, uh, they had to pay $2.6 billion. So it just keeps going on. And then, of course, when I was uh, traveling throughout the world, and, and, and so many folks were say, many, many uh, countries were asked the question, well, are you looking at other, you know, financial institutions outside of Switzerland? So we had Bank Lilumi <laughs> out, of, uh, out of Israel in which we prosecuted as well. So there's a number of different financial institutions that were assisting U.S. taxpayers for hiding their funds. Then let's, let's take it one more step further. What we did, and at the time I was the Director of International, work with our War Department of Justice on a, I think, historic, historic uh, program, in which we call the Swiss Bank Program, in which individuals, so we had 80 additional Swiss banks that came in and actually expressed actually expressed that they had some culpability of helping U.S. citizens file or uh, evade their taxes. So billions of dollars were associated with that as well. So, you know, those are just some of the highlights, but I, I will, uh, there's so many stories to share, but I, I will I will give you one more as well. Uh, pretty much everyone knows of the, the FIFA investigation. And this is the, the, the interesting part of this is that the FIFA investigation was probably one of the largest international corruption cases in the world. And, and so you have individuals receiving kickbacks, bribes, different things of that nature. And I'll share with you how that investigation was started. It was started by one of our agents actually looking at an individual and looking at an individual. And there was an article about the, uh, Mr. Blazer, Chuck Blazer, which was a FIFA uh, individual uh, officer who was trying to, had a number of different assets and he was just was sharing that within the article. Hmm. So this piqued the interest of our agent and he started looking into that and finally recognized the fact that he had evaded so much taxes and that led to the over bigger corruption in partnership with the FBI on the FIFA investigation in which millions and millions and millions of bribes had been going on for years. And, wow. and one of the largest, largest uh, international corruption investigation as well. So 
Uh, I have so many more stories that I can share with you, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. But it's a it's a fascinating job, and it, it's been it's been great doing that as well. Absolutely fascinating. It sounds fascinating. It sounds like you know the beginning of some kind of thriller, um, <laughs> some kind of, you know, movie thriller. Um, uh, Sound like you're ready to write a book, right? You're ready to write a book. Yeah, right? I, I you know I would love to do that. I would love to do that. <laughs> So you've uh, talked uh, about sort of these big, pro high profile kinds of cases. What about, you know, regular individual taxpayers, um, mm -hmm. non filers, uh, other mm -hmm. kinds of common compliance issues? Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that when the commissioner asked me uh, to come over from the criminal side to our civil side in which you're dealing with more so the individual, which is the first time in the history of the IRS in which a deputy chief has come over from um, the criminal side to the civil side to take over. And so within small business self-employed, just to kind of give you some context, um, that portfolio there is 57 million taxpayers of uh, individuals and uh, um, small businesses that are um, that file uh, their corporations under 10 million, and, and and so you have a lot of self-employed individuals that are there, and so the portfolio includes employment tax, excise tax, estate and gift tax, uh, Bank Secrecy Act information. Also have under my purview all the collection activities. So we have I have 20,000 employees that are there to try to assist. And, and working with individuals and say our overall mission though is to help taxpayers meet their tax obligations. So there's that service component, but also being there as well as to um, ensure that they meet their tax. So we have to um, have them there to understand, I should say, their tax obligation and then to meet. So have that scales of justice um, that is right there for them. And so with that, we are working on a new initiative that we had this year on high income non filers. Now, it's hard to believe that you had those who are making a significant amount of funds and they don't file. So, the way we've characterized that are individuals who are making over $100,000 and that have not filed their tax return. So, what we uh, initiated a, um, a compliance effort in which what we decided to do is we publicize and say, hey, we're coming to your particular state. And if you haven't filed, we're coming to visit you. And so <laughs> that has been hugely successful, uh, hugely successful. So it comes over. So I'm using communications as a force multiplier, because once you communicate that out, then you have individuals who will file and then we'll bring a group of individuals to sometimes uh, areas in which we uh, don't have the resources as much as we need to, and we are addressing that. It's been usually successful from an individual tax return or just from an employee um, employee tax returns as well. So I will I will start off by I'll ask you a question there, Vanessa. What is your favorite number? Uh, like any number, like okay. three. Any number, <laughs> three. three. So I'll say your favorite number should be 95. And I say 95 because the IRS is responsible for bringing in 95% of all the revenue that comes into this country. And so you see that, that rocket ship going up for NASA and all that, you have to think about the IRS and that is there. And 5% of that is released to employment tax. So it is critical that we have strong enforcement efforts as it relates to um, employment tax. And one of the reasons why the commissioner asked me to come over is to really have a laser focus on our enforcement uh, efforts and compliance activity and the high income non filers and our revenue officers going out doing additional sweeps uh, are, are just additional activities. I will also say we have with the increase of marijuana businesses uh, across the country. Um, we uh, we have a new initiative this year and working and, and uh, looking at marijuana businesses as well. So that's another area in which we are, are pursuing. But 
there's so many other uh, compliance issues. Uh, one of the more significant one that we're looking at right now uh, for individuals and in partnership is what I call syndicated conservation easements in which individuals who are coming together trying to um, invest in uh, to conserve an easement but what you have found is though they've kind of syndicated it and developed a number of different partnerships and, and they've overinflated the value of that property. And, and so, um, and so therefore we're taking a strong look at that issue because, because, uh, you know, one day we've seen properties that are worth uh, 1 million today. And then once it becomes a syndicated conservation easements is worth 15 million. So, Obviously, you know, your, your spidey sense goes off and said, hmm, is that, uh, is that right? But so that's, <laughs> that's another significant area <laughs> that we're looking at. Wow. So now that you are sort of focused in this sort of small business world, what are some of the major issues that small business have, small businesses have when it comes to their taxes and tax compliance? And what is it that you all do to try to help them? No, I, I think here again, that's a great question. I mean, and especially during this time. I mean, the COVID crisis has been challenging for all of us. Um, and, and one of the things that we have been doing and, and throughout this process is first looking and, and thinking about our employees. As I expressed, I have 20,000 employees. And at the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, approximately about 50% of them were, were non-portable. And, and so one of my first objectives to ensure that we were providing the right service to taxpayers is to get them portable, to get them working again. And, and um, doing a couple, a uh, few months process uh, was able to get up to 91% of our employees to be able to answer questions on the phone. So I, I have that uh, on, on, or some collection matter that they may have, or uh, be able to, we, we put a pause. Uh, we had a, a new initiative called People First Initiative in which we put a pause on actually doing uh, audits or, or uh, collection activities at that time, and such, and unless it was a really egregious activity. Um, but the thing that we are doing is that we are going out educating individuals on all this new legislation that has come out uh, with the CARES Act, the Family First Act, in which individuals can um, defer something that relates to employment tax. So we're trying to educate individuals as much as possible, uh, even beyond your um, your traditional means. We have a new initiative that we've worked on this year called Hearing All Voices, in which we are working with uh, individuals with limited English proficiency, and we're having right. half-day sessions with them just to kind of listen to what are some of the challenges they're having as far as being able to adhere to uh, their tax returns. So that's been hugely successful. We've we've done eight of those. We were trying to do them face-to-face -face within their, in their chamber of commerce, but we had to switch to uh, more virtual. So we've done within the Hispanic community, uh, the Chinese community, uh, Korean. And so we've worked across the board to really try to see how do we can educate them on, on simple issues, um, you know, more so sometimes even just understanding the Bill of Rights and the Taxpayer Bill of Rights as to what they, uh, they should expect from the IRS. But many questions, uh, if they're owing owe funds as far as setting up an installment agreement or trying to set up what do we call like more of an offering compromise. So. We're, we're, we have a, a full complement of things to uh, provide services to the taxpayers, but I'll add this too. One thing that taxpayers should really look to is the irs.gov. There's so many resources there as far as small businesses uh, that individuals can and do. But I, I, another, I, I, here again, I have so many stories here on the civil side as well. A new, a new, um, uh, avenue that we're pursuing and we're just coming out with this new if an individual owes funds and so majority of individuals have smartphones right now so we have just added a QR code to the notice so if you get a notice there should be a QR code so now you can just scan that QR code and actually go directly to where you need to pay and it's I mean that's I mean that's fascinating from the standpoint that now you don't have to sit on the phone 
and wait as long. Some people still may want to do that. So we were trying to come up with multiple ways in which individuals can interact with us. But I, I think the, the QR code is going to be a game changer as well. Let me let me let me add a, a, another point too, because I have just revolutionized our, our office of fraud enforcement as well, which is on the civil side, in which we are interacting with all the business units uh, within the IRS to to just identify additional fraud. So um, so I just hired a new, uh, but it's been about six months ago, a former CI special agent to come over to lead up that office as well to to really kind of push for you know fraud activities because from my vantage point you and i both want to ensure that you are paying your fair share and i'm paying my fair share so if there's fraudulent activities we need to ensure that that gets referred over to our criminal investigations office or also pushing for civil fraud penalties if it's warranted so there's a lot going on here a lot of great activity so Awesome. Thanks. Well, I think this is, uh, we have time for one more question. So I'll ask, since you mentioned that you all are hiring uh, for our yes. students and any of our alums out there, what kind of skills do, do folks need to be successful in today's business environment from your perspective? Um, no, no, I, I think that's great because I, I, we, I'm quite sure you and and I, we, we get we get this question quite a bit um, from young individuals. And first of all, I, I, I try to be as assertive and resourceful as possible. Um, and speaking of the IRS, you know, there are uh, a plethora of um, jobs. I mean, we have engineers. You know, one of the things that I'm hiring right now are data scientists. We have a great research firm, uh, research uh, organization within small business self-employed. So we're matching up a data scientist with a subject matter expert being a uh, revenue agent, revenue officer, or criminal investigation and kind of coming up with algorithms and models. Um, but the, the key factor is, is, is being, uh, don't take no for an answer, in my opinion, in regards to pushing and pursuing and being aggressive. Uh, I have two young adults myself and I, I <laughs> graduated and, and one who has one more semester to go. And you know the key factor is hard work and, and, and pursuing that and, um, and using that network. I think the, the, the one factor that I think a lot of individuals don't think about as much is using your network as much as possible. So, uh, you know, those are just some of the, you know, some of the essential things that I think would be uh, for a young adult. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for, for joining us today. Um, I would also like to thank everyone who joined online and I'd like to invite you to the next session of George Talks Business uh, in our series. Next Thursday, our guest will be Dr. Sam Priyadarshi, Principal and Global Head of Portfolio Risk and, Deliver and Derivatives at Vanguard. And he will be interviewed by Professor Rodney Lake, Deputy Chair of the Department of Finance and Director of the GW Investment Institute. So we hope you all will join us then. Again, another shout out to Banneker class of 1985. Thanks again, 85. Eric. 85. <laughs> 85. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful, no, thank you. wonderful week. Thanks a Perry, lot. I should say. <laughs> <laughs>